Thank you, Angie's, for, for that great meal. They do a lot of catering for us, and they always do a really good job, so we appreciate that. Um, our speaker tonight is Coach Michael Burt, and uh, he w we were fortunate enough to have him speak to us at the graduation last year, and he is just he's really, really good, and we're so pleased to have him here tonight to speak to you. I'm gonna, I want to thank First Bank and Sandra Morrison and Mike Henderson for scheduling him to be here tonight to speak to us and I'm going to ask Mike Henderson to come up and introduce him real quick. Thank you President Jerry. I get the, the distinct pleasure of introducing Coach Burt to everyone again. I've done it several times now down here. Um, <clears throat> many of you may have heard Coach Burt speak on the radio. He's on radio station out of Murfreesboro every day, every morning, pretty early, 7 o'clock, right, Coach? I'm not, I'm not up always at 7 o'clock. Um, coach Burt uh, is First Bank's motivation and sales coach for a reason of which you're about to witness. But I want to say a couple of things about Coach. He's obviously a very learned man. He is an adjunct professor at MTSU, and has a very lengthy uh, bio. I'm not going to go over that. I'll save you all of that. Uh, but I would like to say that when Coach Burt first got into coaching at Riverdale High School in Murfreesboro, he was coaching the women's basketball program. Well, most people up in that part of the world and even down here would say, you, you mean they, they have a women's team at Riverdale? I mean, they're a football school, right? Well, they were, and they still are to a certain extent. But Coach Burt came on the scene as head basketball coach for the women's team. Girls didn't, didn't know much about playing, didn't know how to win, didn't have a clue how to win. But Coach Burt instilled skills in those girls that enabled them to realize their potentials. They, they learned that they could win that they could do things that they didn't think that they could. And it's all about leadership and motivation. And that, that's where Coach Burt gets an A+. Plus. But I'm glad to introduce to you all tonight uh, our coach at First Bank, uh, Coach Michael Burt. <clears throat> Thank you, Mike. It's so good to be here in Lincoln County. If I come back one more time, I'm going to get a vacation house here in Lincoln County, okay? <laughs> when I think of leadership, I go back to when I was 15 years old, grew up in a small town of Woodbury, Tennessee. And I still remember the most exciting thing we did in Woodbury, Tennessee when I was 15 was the whole town got together to watch them build a Hardee's. And it was a real exciting time. That we said they're putting a door on and they're putting a, the whole town will come together and go, oh my God, they put a drive through in. And so I grew up in this small town, but at 15 years old, I had a little league baseball coach who was a leader. And he looked at me and he said, I was wondering if you'd come help me coach this junior pro basketball team. And I said, I would love to. See, he saw the potential in me when I did not see it in my own self. He said, this is a young man that can help mold other young men. So I got all dressed up and I went down to coach this junior league, junior pro basketball team when I was 15. I dressed up in a suit. I looked like a little Pat Riley. And I used to tell people I look like a little Rick Patino, but I don't use that quote anymore when I'm talking, right? And I looked like a little Pat Riley and I coached this junior pro basketball team and I had found something that most people look their whole life for and that is what they are deeply passionate about. Passion defined in the dictionary is this irresistible belief for motive or action. It's what drives your engine. It's what rows your boat. It's what gets you excited. It's what you could talk about for days. And I had found my unique voice in life. I was so passionate at 15 years old about coaching and winning that I got ejected from a junior pro basketball game. That means they threw me out of the game. My best friend, it started a long-standing relationship between me and referees all over the country. But I coached that team at 15 and 16 and 17, and that mentor that I had, and Charles Tremendous Jones says this, five years from today, 
we will all be the exact same person we are now, with the exception of two things, the people we meet and the books that we read. So I always ask people, who are you meeting with? Who's leading you and what are you reading? Because they can significantly impact your life. So that person that saw the good in me and leadership is about affirming and validating the worth and potential in people in so clear a way, they begin to see it in their own self. I bet every person who's here today, especially our students and especially the new people that are going through this program, got to where they are today because somebody somewhere chose to see the good in them versus the bad. They chose to illuminate and validate your own worth and potential in so clear a way you begin to see it in your own self. Now think back in your life about the people that looked at you and told you that you were good enough to do this, that wouldn't let you quit when you wanted to quit, that wouldn't let you bail out when you wanted to bail out, that helped you, in essence, get to where you are today. And I guarantee you it was a teacher, a friend, a professor, a spouse, a parent, a coach, a band director, a cheerleading sponsor, a leadership Lincoln mentor. Somebody chose to build you up versus tear you down. And that little coach, he said, look, if you, you, you've got fire, you've got passion, you've got enthusiasm, you've got talent. He said, you need to be a coach. Unbeknownst to me, and especially to the young people in the room here tonight, I didn't realize that he would unlock the door to my life's work of coaching other people and helping them reach their deepest human potential. This idea of embryonic growth that will be better tomorrow than we were today and better today than we were yesterday, that we continue to grow in an upward spiral of improvement. We never, ever reach where we're going. We're in search for progress, not always perfection. And I went back at 18 years old to my little elementary school in my hometown, Woodbury Grammar, and I walked into the principal's office. And I said, I want to be the head boys basketball coach at this school. And he looked at me and he laughed, as many people will do when you have big dreams in life. He said, you're just 18 years old. We can never make you the head boys basketball coach of this school. And I said, trust me, I have the power of my conviction. I am deeply passionate. Put me with an adult and I can handle it. And it was one of the first times in my life I truly understood. Many times we get what we want in life by doing one thing, asking. Asking to expand our territory. And he said, you know what, I like your attitude. And, and if you're in sales, guess what? The number one thing that 80% of people say they want from a salesperson. One thing, enthusiasm excitement about what they're selling. Well, I was selling myself. And he gave me that job. I coached a team. I built my own office. And in the very first year, we won a state championship. And he came to me and said, Coach, you did such a good job. And our principal uh, superintendent will understand that. You did such a great job. We'd like to pay you. And I said, Pay me. How much are you going to pay me? He said, $199.50. He said, but, but we have never won a championship at this school. And we love winning championships, please come back next year and coach. And I said, I will, because I understood that every day at your current job could be an interview for your next job. Every day in your current role could be an interview for your next role because, see, people are constantly watching, judging, critiquing, evaluating. They're trying to figure out if you're the next big rock star so you can have upward mobility. And so I came in every day and dressed up in a suit and coached that little basketball team because I knew that somebody somewhere would notice. And at 19 years old, the head coach at Riverdale did notice. And he picked up the phone and called me and said, I heard about you. I heard you're this young little whippersnapper that can flat out coach your pants off. Will you come to Riverdale and be my assistant coach? And I said, well, you know what my first question is? I've got to ask this. How much you going to pay me to come to Riverdale? I'm already making $199.50. And he said, Coach, we'll pay you $2,000. And I said, $2,000? I will be there tonight. <laughs> and I took that job at Riverdale. And I came in every day and I started to develop what leaders really need to develop, which is a dominant aspiration. You very seldom hear me use the word goals. I don't write about goals in all of my books that I've written. I write about dominant aspiration. A dominant aspiration is not your number one thing. I mean, not your number two thing, your number three thing, your number four thing. It's your number one thing. What's interesting to me about life is when we're young, we go to school, when we're five, six years old, seven years old, and we say, man, if we could just get out of this little elementary school and go to middle school, it would just be so great, wouldn't it? And then we get to middle school, sixth and seventh grade, and we say, man, if we could just go to high school, we get to high school, it'll be so great. And then we go to high school and we say, what? Man, I can't wait. 
to get out of high school and get a job or, or go to college. And then you get a job and go to college and guess what? You say, well, man, I can't wait to get married. And then you get married and you say, man, I can't wait to have children. And then you get that job you want and you say, what? Man, I can't wait to retire. And then those kids you had, you said, man, I can't wait for these kids to do what? Move out. <laughs> and then you get a little bit older and you say, man, I can't wait for those kids to move back in. See? And we spend our whole lives thinking about, man, I just can't wait to get there. When the reality is at the end of your life, my saying is very simple. We'll far more regret what we didn't do with our life than what we did. At the end of our life, when we look back over it, we will far more regret what we knew we could have done, what we should have done, what we were capable of doing, but we did not do. And the only person that really stopped us was us, see. In my third book, This Ain't No Practice Life, I said this, we only get one life, but if we work it just right, one life is all we'll ever need. So you don't want to constantly say, well, just wait till I get there. Well, at Riverdale, I had a dominant focus that was to become the head coach. And I understood that, that the way to become a head coach was to be a great assistant, see? This is the art and practice of serving another person. So the head coach, I said, hey, I'll get you a bag. I'll drive the bus. I'll coach the team. I'll let your dogs out, whatever you need me to do. I will be the best assistant in the world. I had no ego whatsoever. I said, I am totally humble and teachable. And at 52 years old, he retired. And he said, I will not retire unless one person replaces me. It's my right hand, Michael Burr. And I got that job at 22 years old, and I started to lead every single day. Leadership is the great enabling art. Halfway through that journey, I was 25 years old. I was on a beach in Destin, Florida. I wrote a book called Changing Lives Through Coaching. I think today people desperately want to be motivated, validated, appreciated, affirmed, and they want to be inspired. That word inspired means to breathe life into. The word motivate means to move. When you're in the presence of a person who is inspired in their own life, does that inspire you? Of course it does. When you see a class act, if you were looking at a world-class person, and when you're in the presence of a world-class person, a world-class leader, do you know it? And the answer is yes. When you're in the presence of a world-class salesperson, do you know it? Yes. When you're in the presence of a world-class leader, do you know it? Yes. So I ask people, what's the difference between a world-class leader and you? Because we always seek to emulate what we would like to become, see. 25 years old, I wrote that book, Changing Life Through Co Coaching, because so many people wanted to be coached in today's world. They did not want to be managed like a thing. You see, if you're a leader, you understand that people are made up of four parts, a body, a mind, a heart, and a spirit. Each of these parts produce four different needs, four different capacities, Four different intelligences. The body's need is to live. It's to put food on the table. It's to meet the economic realities of the world. The mind's need is to learn, to grow, to expand, not to ever fall victim to atrophy or stagnation. The heart's need is to love and be loved. It's where both passion and compassion comes from. The spirit's needs to leave a legacy, to matter, to contribute, to be part of something bigger than self, to connect to a higher purpose. So a whole person in a whole job would do four things, to live, to love, to learn, to leave a legacy. At 25 years old, I wrote that book, Changing Lives Through Coaching. All of my friends, young people, I want you to especially listen to this. All of my friends made fun of me. They said, who are you to write a book? Who's going to read your book? You're just from Woodbury, Tennessee. And I said, I don't care who's going to read my book. I'm going to write it. And I wrote that book, and I still remember the very first time that book sold on Amazon. I was 25 years old. I was living in an apartment. And, and, a, and they send me an email that says, your book has been bought by this person, and we are shipping it to this person. And I started jumping up and down in my apartment. And then I picked up the phone and called my mother. And I said, Mama, thank you for buying a copy of my first book. <laughs> but it sold. And as I started that journey, I began to find my voice and inspire other people to find their voice. And I started to figure this out, that life was really about figuring out what you're deeply passionate about, what you're naturally talented at, where there's a need in the world that the world will pay you for, what you love and what you're good at. And no matter how many years you go to school, very seldom will they ever ask you that question. A, what are you deeply passionate about? 
What puts your fun meter on high? What do you love doing every single day? What are you good at doing? What are you naturally talented at? See, I love country music. But you don't want to be in a car with me if I'm singing country music, right? Because I have no talent there. Where is there a need in the world that will pay you for what you love and what you're good at that marries your conscience, your need for meaning and purpose and contribution, see? There's, there's simply a difference between an occupation and a vocation. An occupation is that which occupies your time in which you receive a paycheck for. Vocation comes from the Latin term voice or calling in life. You say, why is this so important, coach? Well, it's important because the average person will spend 23 years of their life sleeping. Nine and a half years in their car. Six years eating. Between five and 15 years in some form of spiritual or religious activity. Between 15 and 25 years in education or training. And here's the kicker, folks. Between 35 to 50 years of their life working. The largest percentage of your life will be spent in and through an organization. And an organization is nothing more than a relationship with a purpose. If you don't believe in the cause of the purpose, the people of the purpose, the vision of the purpose, there's very little chance you'll give your whole self to the purpose. Six out of every ten people that I speak to across this country, over 120,000 people over the past five years, get up and go to jobs they're not passionate about. They will spend 35 to 50 years of their life in those jobs. All of their satisfaction will come off the job. Can you be a great leader if you don't have the emotional fuel and passion to be a great leader? Can you imagine me walking in here tonight saying, you know, I'm going to talk about leadership, but whew, it's been a long day, and man, I just barely can make it through the day, and I'm just not very excited about being here tonight. But I want to get you guys excited. You see, the first role of leadership is what? It's to model the behavior that you want from other people. You want people to be enthusiastic? You need to be enthusiastic. You want people to work hard? They need to see you work hard. You lead by example, but guess what? It's not the only role of leadership. The second role of leadership is to paint a picture about where we're going and how we're going to get there. Some people call it pathfinding. And this is where a lot of leaders drop the ball. We don't ever talk about where we're going. We just get up and we go to work every single day and do the same thing over and over and over. One definition of insanity is to keep doing what you're doing. Expect something different to happen. The largest percentage of heart attacks that happen in this country happen Monday morning between 6 and 8 a.m. Some people would rather die than go to work, wouldn't they? <laughs> the least amount of heart attacks hap happen Friday afternoon between 4 and 6 p.m. The number one fear in this country is a fear of public speaking. The number two fear in this country is a fear of dying. Some people would rather be in the casket than giving the eulogy. Now think about that. So as you start to think about your life and you begin to find your unique voice, why you're here, what your purpose is, when you begin to model the behavior you want from other people, paint a picture about where we're going, and then put them in systems that they cannot fail in. In 1952, there was a milkshake machine salesman. He walked into a little bitty hamburger stand in San Bernardino, California. And he walked into that little hamburger stand and he was floored by what he saw in that little hamburger stand. How fast they made the hamburgers. They had little high school students do it. Anybody could do it. He was so awed by what he saw that he offered to buy the hamburger stand on the spot. Now I want you to remember this was a milkshake machine salesman. And there's two brothers that own that little hamburger shop, and they said, we can never sell you this little hamburger shop. This is how we're going to make all our money. And he said, no, you're not going to make all your money off this one little hamburger shop. You will make all your money off building a great little hamburger shop with systems that are so simple that anybody could do them. And he tried for years, and they wouldn't sell them that until finally they gave in, and they sold that little hamburger shop, that little small business, to that person. His name was Ray Kroc, 1952. And he bought a little hamburger stand called McDonald's from the McDonald's brothers. And he said, I will go to work on the business, not in the business. And I will build systems as a leader that anybody could duplicate. And all the money will be made by how many times we duplicate the system. So a great leader builds systems where people cannot fail within those 
systems. After I won a championship at Riverdale, every person tried to get me to retire. They said, y'all, your players are gone. You graduated everybody. You need to go out on top. And I said, no, I will come back one more year to prove that when you build great systems, you can take good players in a great system and still win. You see, as a leader, you start to build systems. So that's the third part. And the part, fourth part is to empower people. Once you put people in systems, you begin to get out of their way and let them work. But we don't do that very many times, do we? We try to manage people versus things. You see, you lead people, you manage things. You cannot manage another person who has their own body, mind, heart, and spirit unless they choose to be managed. Kind of reminds me of a fellow that had a dog and never owned a dog in his life. He said, Michael, you're never going to believe what this stupid little dog does. I said, well, what does he do? He said, all he does is use the bathroom and the living room floor. I said, well, what are you going to do about that? He said, I'll tell you what I'm going to do about that. The next time he does it, I'm going to spank him on the hind end with a newspaper, and I'm going to throw him out the kitchen window. And I said, well, call me in three weeks and tell me how that works for you. He calls me back in three weeks. He said, Michael, you're never going to believe what this stupid little dog has done. He said, he used the bathroom and the living room floor, and he ran and jumped out the kitchen window. And I said, now that's what you taught him to do, right? We do the same things with people. So a leader is a person that walks their own talk. They practice what they preach. They don't practice duplicity. They don't say one thing over here and another thing over here. They don't do one thing out in public and one thing behind. They have integrity. And integrity means one integrated life. What you see is what you get, see. So that's the first role of leadership. Now, so how do you go about finding this in your life? Well, there's a couple key decisions that you need to make. And I wrote about these decisions in this book, This Ain't No Practice Life. I will tell you that my English teacher, who taught me very well, called me when she found out this book was out and said, I told you about double negatives, right? And I said, look, I'll give you some money from the book. Just be happy. <laughs> but in that book, I talk about a couple... Seven decisions. I'm not going to talk about all seven of those decisions tonight. I'm going to talk about a few of those decisions. If you want to be a big-time leader, you first have to understand what leadership is and how you define it. I define it as finding your voice, inspiring other people to find theirs. I define it as affirming and validating the worth and potential in people in so clear a way they begin to see it in their own self. Every leader I have ever met that was a great leader, especially in today's world, had an optimistic mindset versus a pessimistic mindset. They chose to see the good versus the bad. They chose to build up versus tear down. Reminds me of two little boys. One was a little optimistic boy, and one was a little pessimistic boy, and they were twins. And the parents did not know what to do with this little pessimistic boy. They just cried all the time because they said, well, we got twins, and one of them's great, and one of them sees the bad in everything. If you have multiple children, you may understand this. They said, what are we going to do with these two little boys? So they took these two little boys to the doctor and they said, look, doc, we got a little pessimistic boy. All he does is see the bad in everything. We got a little optimistic boy. All he does is see the good in everything. What can we do? He said, well, I'll tell you what. For that little pessimistic boy, the next time he has a birthday, I want you to give him every single thing he wants and put it in one room. For that little optimistic boy who sees the good in everything, I want you to put a big pile of horse manure in his room and see how he responds to it. So remember, they're twins. They got the same birthday. So they go home that day of their birthday. The little pessimistic boy opens up the door and he sees everything he's ever asked for and he starts crying. And he says, Mama, Daddy, I didn't ask for any of these toys. I mean, good gracious, y'all are the worst parents ever. And they start crying. What are we going to do with this little pessimistic boy? But then they heard all this commotion that diverted their attention. So they went over to the other room and this little optimistic boy was in there and he was jumping up and down in that horseman ear. And they said, Son, what in the world are you doing? And he said, Mama, Daddy, I knew with all this horse money around here, there has got to be a pony somewhere. <laughs> if you're going to be a great leader, it begins by experience and awakening in your life. In the book, I call it Wake Up. When you say wake up, what do you mean? You start to realize time and energy are the two most important things that you'll have. How you choose to spend your time and how you choose to spend your energy determines your quality of life. You begin to confront the brutal facts and tell yourself the truth about your life, about where you are and where you want to go. There's not a person in this room that doesn't understand that they see a picture in their head. This experience in leadership, uh, Lincoln, is designed to do one thing, transform your life. 
That means to come one way and leave another way. That means to be changed, to change your potential. This whole thing of everything that you're going to do on that video is designed to do one thing. Improve your life so you can improve other people's lives. So it starts by waking up and realizing that you have to confront the brutal facts of your own life. It's called wake up. The second thing you have to do, I talk about in the books, you have to experience a dreaming period. And what I mean by dreaming period, when we have children, when they're little children, what do we tell them they can be when they grow up? Honey, when you grow up, you can do what? Be whatever you want to be. What stops that? Why do we demotivate people to do that? Then at some point, they get about 18, 19 years old, we look at them and we go, Honey, I don't know how to tell you this, but I don't know if you can be whatever you want to be. We begin to demotivate people to dream. You see, there's always a creative tension in people's lives between where they want to be versus where they actually are. And until you start to close the gap between where you want to be versus where you actually are, then guess what you do? You just stay exactly where you are and do what? You complain about it, whine about it, mope about it, feel sorry about it, blame other people. Every person in this room is where they are today based on one thing. Every decision they have made up until today, every person has put themselves exactly where they are. We, are, we have all been predisposed to our past, but we've never predetermined by that past. Every person in this room has been deeply scripted by the psychological uh, impact of their past, the genetic impact of their past, the physiological, the environmental impact of their past, but not one person in this room is predetermined by that past. So when I see people from small towns, almost every time I go into a small town, there's usually a sign that says, this town is the home of, it's usually that one superstar that came out of that town, right? Why can't there be multiple superstars? Why can't there be more people that have a deep impact? And you can't play the whole small town thing on me because I'm from a town that Lincoln County makes my town look like a metropolis, right? I mean, Lincoln County is a metropolis to my town. So when you start dreaming, what I want to encourage you to do is do things you've never done before with Leadership Lincoln. Now, the third thing you got to do once you wake up, once you dream up, third thing you got to do, and this is the final thing I tell you, is you got to clean up. There's a cleansing period. And what I mean by that is there are certain emotional toxins that keep people from winning in life. Let me give you just a few of them. Comparing is emotional toxin. It's emotional cancer. A, ca- a, a cancer is a cell inside the body that loses its social identity, that disassociates itself from the group, and then attacks the very group it was a part of. In the workplace, we call those people emotional cancers. And leaders are never emotional cancers. Leaders are never part of the problem. They're always part of the solution. So what do leaders not do? Leaders don't complain. Leaders don't compare. Leaders don't criticize. Leaders do not become complacent, which is one of the biggest emotional cancers out there, in my opinion, is that you just put your life on autopilot and you just stay exactly where you are. Because there's no such thing in life as staying where you are, right? You're either getting better or you're getting worse. There is no such thing as staying. Leaders don't compete with other people. They believe in abundance versus scarcity. And you know what I like to see a lot of people do, leaders? They have fun. Now, I get to fly all over the country with my new job, and, and I get to fly all the airlines, but there's only one airline that consistently has fun. You know which airline that is? Southwest. And they don't give you anything. A little bitty pack of peanuts, right? They line you up like a 30 cattle getting on a plane. And they herd you on the plane. But they have fun. And so I'm getting on a Southwest plane not long ago. And I get on that plane and they say, thank you so much for flying Southwest. We know you have a choice when you fly. We have a very special visitor on our plane today. That visitor is 95 years old. And he has never flown a day in his life life. Today just happens to be his birthday. And then they pause. And they say, if you don't mind, as you step inside this plane, please step inside the cockpit and say, happy birthday to your pilot. (laughs) They have fun. So if you were to sum up leadership, and to me, in all of the books that I've written, including the newest one, called The Anatomy of Winning. How do you rewire people to win? I wrote this book with a coach that the folks in Lincoln County might know. His name was Rick Ensel. 
And for many years, Rick Ensel was my biggest nemesis. He was the coach at Shelbyville Central High School. And for me to win a championship, I had to go through Rick Ensel. And for many years, I was on the wrong side of that game. Until finally, in my eighth year, I came up with a master strategy because great leaders always have a strategy to win. And I finally figured out how to beat those Shelbyville Golden Eagleettes in my eighth year at Riverdale. You know what it was? It was to get rid of Coach Ensel. <laughs> and when I got rid of Coach Ensel, I finally won that championship that I had been longing for. And it was a great strategy. But in that book, we talk about seven components of building a championship culture. Leaders build great cultures, don't they? They wake up, they dream up, they clean up, and sometimes they clean up the culture. When I first came out of college, I was so motivated to change the world. That's why I went to college to be a teacher. And I got out of, I got out of college, and I went, and they stuck me right beside a person who'd been teaching for 47 years and hated kids. <laughs> and they stuck me right beside another person who if they had to be there at 7.30 in the morning, they rolled in on two wheels at 7.29.30. And if they could leave at 2.41, they'd knock students down on the afternoon to get out the door at 2.41.30. And here's the kicker, folks. They would back their car in in the morning. And if you go to work tomorrow and see people who have backed their car in so they can run out of there in the afternoon, you know people are in occupation versus a vocation, Right? And three weeks, I had idea after idea. Let's do this. Let's do this. Let's do this. Let's do this. And guess what? It's like a ping pong ball back and forth. No, 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 no. Till finally, they just said, look, we don't, we don't, we're not really as excited about kids as you are, okay? And what happens to a person that's highly motivated in a demotivated culture? What happens to that person? We know what happens to that person, don't we? They become demotivated, don't they? If you get up and go to work every single day and work for a leader that has a negative culture, culture defined as how we do business, over a period of time you become demotivated and you start to say things like, why, why are we going to even try to change anything around here? Nobody wants to change anything around here. We just always have done it just like this. See, you know what the number one person that drives a culture is? The leader. And we always encourage what we allow. We allow people to be late, they'll be late. We allow people to be negative, they'll be negative. Always encourage. We allow people to, to, to not do what they're supposed to. That's exactly what they will do. In nine years of a head coach, I had a couple rules. One was don't ever be late to any meeting. Be 15 minutes early to every meeting. If you don't get here 15 minutes early to the meeting, you don't get in the meeting. If you don't get in the meeting, you don't practice. And if you don't practice, guess what you don't get to do? You don't play. You know how many people I had laid in nine years of being a head coach? One. We encourage what we allow as a leader. So as you make this journey, I want to remind you of what leadership is. It's about seeing the good versus seeing the bad. It's about building up versus tearing down. It's about illuminating and validating the worth and potential and building more than anything else that you do. Building future leaders. You see, go back to that 15-year-old when that coach saw the good in me and unlocked my, unlocked my potential for the rest of my life. The best thing you can do as a leader is to teach other people how to lead, teach other people how to build, teach other people how to coach. Now, I'm going to close with this poem. It's my favorite poem, and I would be happy to email you this poem if you leave me your email over here as we go out. If you want any of the books, if you want to say hi, please stop by and do. I would love to speak to each one of you. This was written in 1968 by a gentleman named Kent M. Keith. He wrote this while he was in college, and unbeknownst to him, this poem got out, traveled all over the country, over 300,000 copies. Even Mother Teresa had this in her own home in Calcutta for children when they visited. Well, lots of people have gotten credit for this poem, but 1968, while he was in college, Kent M. Keith actually wrote it. He came back in 1998 and wrote a book called Anyway. And this sums up a great leadership philosophy. It says, people are unreasonable, they're illogical, and they're self-centered. You need to love them anyway. If you do good, people will accuse you of selfish, ulterior motives. Do good anyway. If you are successful, you're going to win false friends and true enemies. Succeed anyway. The good you do today may be forgotten tomorrow. Do good anyway. Honesty and frankness make you weak and vulnerable. 
be honest and frank anyway. The biggest people with the biggest ideas can be shot down by the smallest people with the smallest minds. Think big anyway. What you spend years building up may be destroyed overnight. Build anyway. People need help but will attack you if you help them. You help them anyway. And you give the world the best you got. And you may get kicked in the teeth time and time again. But folks, you give the world the best you got anyway. The number one intelligence for success in today's society is not IQ. It's not intellect quotient. It's not how smart you are. The number one intelligence to be successful in today's world is emotional intelligence. It's the ability to bounce back from adversity when you've been knocked down. It's the ability to be self-intrinsically motivated versus motivated by an external factor. It's the ability to have awareness of self and compassion for others. It's ability, the it's ability to work well in teams. If you have children, one of the greatest things you can teach them is how to find their unique voice in life. Why they're here. How can they use that talent to build a better world? In everyone's life, our inner fire burns out. That fire is then burst into flame by an encounter with another person. And we should all be thankful for those people who rekindle our inner spirit. Thank you for inviting me tonight. And I hope you have a wonderful Leadership Lincoln class this year. And contrary to what everybody said, because everybody told me they were the best, right? The reality is every single class is the best. Out of the people that dropped out of this program that could have come between thinking and doing, something got in their way, right? Right? But for the 12 people that made a decision to step up this year, to take their time and energy and commitment to be better, I thank you. God bless you. Appreciate you. Thank you so much, Coach, for coming and talking to us tonight. It was it was wonderful as usual, and I do encourage everybody to take a look at his books over there on the way out. I got one last time he was here, and it's, they're really, really good. He'll be happy to sign them for you, I'm sure. Uh, but once again, I'd like to thank First Bank for, for bringing him out here. It was wonderful of them to do that. I'd like to thank Angie's Catering. I think they're gone, but I'll thank them anyway for uh, bringing us such a great meal. Uh, Washington Street Church of Christ for letting us have our meeting here. Um, all these mums on the tables, there's one for each of the uh, classmates. So y'all grab one on your way out. And uh, we appreciate everybody coming here. And, you know, thank you. I think you're all going to have a wonderful time this year. And holler at us if you need anything. And we'll see you Friday morning at, uh, at the chamber. <laughs>